Thank you, thank you very much, Michaela. Um, so hopefully you can all hear me okay. Uh, apologies in advance that my uh, voice is slightly going, so I'll try and get through this as best I can. Um, I promise it's not COVID because I've already had it, so I think it's just uh, one of the many, many flus that are going around right now. So um, I'm actually only going to take up a very little uh, amount of your time. Uh, I want to sort of clear the way for um, our two wonderful colleagues from uh, the Plymouth, Plymouth Marine Laboratory who are with us, uh, Shubra and Tom. Uh, who are genuine scientists uh, and deeply knowledgeable about space data and in particular with respect to observing the oceans. Um, so what I'm going to do very quickly is um, race us through a quick sort of 101 on what is satellite Earth observation data. What does it do? How does it work? What can we see with it? Um, but before I get into that, I just wanted to give a little pressy of my own uh, perspective on uh, MTF and, and everything you guys are doing there. And of course, as Michaela said, it's a an entity, an organization that we've, uh, we've admired from afar for, for quite a long time and had the great fortune to, um, to, to, to join you all uh, three years ago in Stockholm. Um, for me, um, the idea of combining art, science, and ways of uh, articulating nature through um, a marriage of, of um, multiple media has been something in my sort of blood since I was a, a child. It's something I've tried to experiment with and, and find ways of doing since I was very young. And um, as a teenager, I began to realize there was a sort of movement emerging, which decades later has manifested in entities like uh, MTF Labs. For me, it was reading books like Douglas Adams's D Dirt Gently, where, of course, there's a, a character who um, has made a, a whole business out of uh, converting uh, natural phenomena into um, music and, and uh, finding ways of developing software to do that. Now for, we can do that for real, of course, and many of you there uh, are doing that routinely uh, every day. What strikes me, though, is there's one whole um, area of data, fundamentally important data, about the natural world that is still a little bit hard to reach for a lot of people, and that is, of course, the data we get from satellites. And there's been a huge uh, sea change in the last few years to democratize access to space technologies. Um, there are all sorts of open data programs that make it a lot easier than it used to be. But for many people, it's still a question of knowing where to start. Uh, we have huge swathes of data being downloaded from hundreds, approaching thousands of satellites uh, every day. Um, and knowing where to start is, is half the problem. So what I'm hoping will happen uh, in the next uh, half an hour is you'll hear from two scientists who can uh, start to help with that, uh, that process of navigating your way through. But as I say, I just want to do a quick sort of 101 myself on, on what is um, Earth observation. So I'm just going to share my screen. Give me a moment. So just going to rattle you through a few images and, and general thoughts on this, uh, this whole topic. So uh, Michaela mentioned, as a company, um, my current venture is Imperative Space, which is uh, an entity that spends a lot of time trying to work out the best ways to communicate with new audiences and non-technical audiences about space data uh, and about the capabilities of space technology to help with problems right here on Earth. And we do that partly through data visualization, but also through education and through a whole gamut of multidisciplinary innovation, uh, including bringing in um, people with, from the arts and from music as well. But the context of what's happening in the space sector is uh, a huge um, growth spurt, as it were. Uh, and this slide just gives a little bit of an insight into that. I think Tom has a, a more up-to-date version of this. He'll show us later on. Um, but this is just a quick sample of some of the, uh, the many, many new satellite missions that are recently or have, um, you know, have recently or, or will soon enter orbit. Uh, and these are just the ones relating to the European Space Agency. Um, you hear about large constellations of satellites, like those from SpaceX and others. Many of those are to do with telecoms and not so much to do with looking at the Earth. But the sheer number of smaller satellites that are now emerging into what we call low Earth orbit, so quite close to the planet, planet is also increasing uh, exponentially. And part of the result of that is that we're getting a, a much wider array of types of data. Oh, and by data, we mean everything from imagery to numerical data that can be put onto a map to understand changes that are happening in the planet. And the European Space Agency in particular has an initiative called the Climate Change Initiative. And this is just a handful of some of the parameters that are routinely being monitored every day with terabytes of data being added to the database on a, on a regular basis. 
And the so-called Sentinel satellites that are funded partly by the European Commission uh, have re revolutionized the position even further because they, all of their data is entirely open and free to use for anybody from businesses to governments to for ed educational purposes and beyond. Uh, and that is creating an opportunity to now generate time series and look at the combinations of data in a way that is simply unprecedented and allows us to, to make something very accessible and very uh, democratized. But we also need to remember that people do go into space still. Uh, we do have people in orbit on the International Space Station and that perspective they have, have of the Earth and the photographs they take also gives us another set of uh, viewpoints um, and also usable data uh, about changes that are happening in the Earth. Uh, whether it's observing large structural changes, let's say in coral reefs or in mangroves, or getting what's often called the overview effect of just seeing how the, the vast interconnectedness of all the Earth systems manifest uh, from that perspective. Uh, this is just a quick slide from a film that we made um, 10, 12 years ago, which uh, really did that in a in a extensive way by emulating Yuri Gagarin's first view of um, the Earth by using a current uh, astronaut in the ISS to take video from the same trajectories as, as he saw 50 years earlier. And of course, one of the things about having astronauts in space is that you can ask them to do things that help enhance that connection with young people in particular, uh, but the wider public more broadly by taking photos of specific things, by observing changes in particular ways in particular areas. And we're very lucky that Richard Garriott, uh, one of the private uh, astronauts from a few years ago, was able to do that for us. And of course, Tim Peake uh, famously took hundreds of incredibly powerful photographs, all accumulated in this uh, fantastic book. But there's also education. There is an incredible thirst of knowledge now, uh, thirst for knowledge emerging from all quarters for the detail of how do you observe the Earth? What is it? that you can actually measure and in what way. And we've played a part in trying to help with that knowledge exchange through uh, so-called MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. If anybody amongst all of you is interested in knowing that next level of depth, um, you can visit imperativemooks.com. It's an entirely free platform uh, which we've created to, to share some of this knowledge from some of the world's leading experts, including uh, Shubra and Tom, who are involved in some of our courses. And it goes on. Uh, the amount of data is vast. But of course, the data from space also needs to be corroborated by what's measured from ground. And so often you have what's called data fusion, which is bringing together data sources from a whole plethora of in situ uh, observations, as well as the space data to get even greater depth of insight. And I'm sure Tom and Schuber will talk more about that in a moment. And this is particularly pertinent in, in areas uh, such as the humanitarian sphere, uh, the World Bank in particular, um, are looking closely at how to make better use of Earth observation data for sustainable development and humanitarian purposes. And of course, the availability of all this data is now making it possible for wider communities of hackers, of makers, and so on, to all now play their part in accessing what previously was quite literally very, very remote. So what do you see? Well, Here's just a quick handful of the kinds of images. Uh, and remember, of course, that Earth observation satellite data is not just about pictures. It's about an incredible array of, of numerical data that can be mapped uh, to, to give even greater insights. But of course, the images taken at different wavelengths themselves provide powerful um, opportunities to, to really see change in incredible detail, but also at vast scale. Satellites give us an opportunity to see things globally as well as locally. We have instruments on board some of these satellites that can have extremely small resolutions that can resolve very, very small details on the ground, but also have huge swaths that allow very large parts of the Earth to be revisited by the same satellite over and over again uh, daily. Um, now, this is a, a sort of quick image of some agricultural land, and you start to get a feel for just how much detail starts to become apparent. An image like this will be many thousands of pixels in dimension. And so once you zoom into that, there's an awful lot you can learn. And then, of course, in a sustainable development context, you need to know where resources are and where resources are in, under strain. And that's particularly pertinent, of course, when you start to think about coastal regions and connecting with the event that, that you guys are all part of, 
The oceans, of course, are critical to that too. And there is really so much you can observe about the oceans from space, and, and Shuba and Tom will talk about that shortly. And just to finish on this general uh, overview, to, to mention again how this concept of bringing different data together is crucially important and opens up even greater insights uh, in how we understand the, uh, the rate and the scale of change that is happening in the world right now. So then this brings us all back to, to art and to music and um, the opportunity to, to collaborate and innovate that you're all involved in right now. And I think we'll all be incredibly aware that the need to find new ways, constantly find new ways, to connect with audiences about the detail of climate change and the impacts on people's real lives is, is ever, urge, ever more urgent. And as we run up towards COP, I think one thing you all, I'm sure, have in the back of your minds is the potential utilitarian value of some of the outcomes that may emerge from, from your collaborations uh, this week. And with that in mind, I just wanted to quickly mention a new project that we ourselves are shortly going to be announcing. And I um, wanted to give a heads up here, having spoken with Michaela about it, because I think there may be a, an opportunity for some overlap and um, synergy, forgive me for using that word, um, between uh, M MTF Labs and uh, this new project called RTO. So RTO, uh, EO here meaning Earth Observation, that's the collective name used for observing the Earth from satellites, uh, is a loose name that we've been using for a number of years to um, bring together a number of projects we've done intermittently to support artists and musicians and others who are interested in working with Earth Observation data. And we are planning to formalize that now and launch um, a new website and a showcase and an opportunity to work in a closer way with artists who want to, to, to utilize this data and need some guidance in, in finding what's right for them and to talk to the relevant experts. Now, we had hoped to be um, announcing a showcase at COP. Uh, in all honesty, it's a little bit up in the air because of the ever-changing logistical position and COVID position uh, with COP26 right now. But um, we will be making further announcements later this month, one way or the other, and there will be further follow-up. So if anybody's interested in that, uh, there's an email address right there if you want to get in contact with us. If you could just put RTO in the subject line of your email, drop us a note and we'll be really happy to talk. Um, and um, just as a little quick flavour to finish on of two ideas of, of, of projects at two ends of the spectrum that may, may sort of seed some thinking. Uh, these two guys, um, uh, uh, Lawrence Osborne on the left and Peter Chennai on the right, um, not so young as they are uh, in that picture now, this was some years ago, but they had um, an incredible insight uh, a few years back to make use of um, climate change data in a, in a very direct way to create some instruments that they then used in a composition. So what they've got in their hands there are bells that were cast in the Whitechapel Bell factory using bell curves from temperature data from different points across the 20th century, which effectively represent climate change through, through those bell curves over a 100-year period. And they took specific periods, they used the profiles of those bell curves to create 3D models, which they then used to create uh, these bells, and then Lawrence uh, turned that into a composition which was then performed by a chamber group from the LSO. And that then generated a whole plethora of other projects which we were involved in supporting, um, where other musicians, other composers responded to what they had achieved with their bells, but also with other uh, data interpretation work. And that created a whole sort of movement around it. So that's just one idea there. And at the other end of the spectrum, this is something that Shuba just introduced to me recently, not directly to do with music, but to do with um, Shuba's topic for later, which is uh, ocean colour, which is itself a scientific parameter, not just a, a visual concept. And this is a ceramicist who's been using that data, that satellite data, in a very direct way to produce some beautiful um, sculptural ceramic works. So just two very vague ideas, many, many more I could talk about, but I hope that sort of seeds some thinking uh, going forward. So sorry for that incredibly fast uh, whistle-stop tour. Um, if you want to get in touch, that's uh, my details. It'd be great to, to hear from you. And um, I hope the rest of the week goes well. And hello to Sitara in the room there. Hope it's all going great for you. And uh, I'm going to hand over now to Tom, but we're going to have to improvise a little bit because Tom's uh, Zoom was not working so great. I, so I, I, I sorted it. You've sorted it, great. So over to you, Tom, and um, I'll let you pick up with uh, 
a bit more detail on, on the ocean data. So I shall now unshare my screen. Over to you. Uh, okay, I needed to be allowed to share first. Is that something I need to do, Andrew? Um, Ravi, you're the host. You can make Tom the host. Ah, right. I need a reminder on how to enable that. Uh, if you go to participants. Um, oh, yeah, got it. Multiple participants. Off we go. And then Tom. click on more on Tom's name. Tom, you should be able to do it now. Is that got working? It. Got it. Great. All right. So just to check that. Uh, get the right screen. Hopefully everyone's seeing the big one. Not the presenter screen. Yeah. Yeah, good. OK. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to give a, a brief overview of some of the things we can see uh, from uh, oceanic remote sensing. Um, it's, as with all these sorts of talks, a little bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, hopefully, you'll see some pretty images and uh, maybe have a little insight into how we monitor the Earth system. Um, and then at the end, obviously, we can have some open discussion. So. Um, yeah, I work at Plymouth Marine Laboratory uh, along the Shuba, uh, and I've spent, I don't know, at least the last eight years working on some of this uh, satellite data for climate applications. Um, so, um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm uh, on Twitter uh, if you want to contact me there. Otherwise, emails um, through the channels that are already um, uh, have been set up within this group. Um, that's fine as well. Uh, so... Uh, EO remote sensing, uh, pretty much all of it obviously relies on uh, detecting some part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, some of the sensors are focused in the visible range, such as ocean color. Uh, some of them uh, are more focused on the microwave or the infrared. Um, and actually, for a lot of the time, we end up using multiple uh, sections of this. So even when we're considering the visible uh, data for the ocean color, we might use data in the infrared to help screen out clouds or things that we aren't necessarily interested in. And uh, so the first example of things we can see, uh, this is a, a, an animation of sea surface temperature mapped from uh, a combination of sensors. Uh, and hopefully you can see there's some um, warming in the North Atlantic here in the Mediterranean as we move into the uh, late summer. You can see uh, Western boundary currents, so these very strong currents along the west coast of uh, continents, which act to transfer heat northwards. You can see cool areas uh, off the west coast of um, continents, which give the, that's the cold upwelling waters. Uh, and you can see equatorial uh, features as well here, some strong currents. And all of this is uh, mapped out continuously over, um, we've got now over 20 years uh, of data. Uh, monitored by satellites for the sea surface temperature. Um, and it, it's, I mean, beyond working from, from a climate perspective, uh, sometimes you can just get lost watching these animations. They're really quite beautiful in their own right. Uh, the next one, uh, so another thing that we can uh, measure, so um, is the height of the sea. Uh, so we use altimetry measurements. Uh, so um, what you do when you get a map of altimetry and the sea surface height, you can start to also uh, map out where the currents in the ocean will be. And that's what this map here shows. So you've got strong currents around the equator. Um, you can see some strong currents in the Southern Ocean here, uh, which is a very uh, dynamic region. Uh, and again, these strong uh, currents, the Gulf Stream here in the North Atlantic and the Kuroshio uh, off Japan. Uh, moving into uh, SAR data, so this is um, information on surface roughness. Uh, and there's a number of things uh, that you can uh, derive once you have this data, but um, actually the images themselves are, are very interesting. Um, and you can see features such as these large internal waves. Uh, so just to give you some scale, this image is about 400 uh, kilometers across, uh, and this is a, a large atoll. Uh, and you can see these internal waves here. Uh, moving across the South China Sea. Uh, on the right, uh, this tiny bright speck here uh, is uh, a ship. And then the dark streak uh, that's uh, dispersing after it is uh, due to oil. So here, the oil uh, on the surface of the ocean 
uh, changes the roughness, you get a slick. Uh, and that's what you're seeing here is a dark feature. Uh, another thing that's um, obviously of interest uh, for um, discussion in uh, times like these with COP26 coming up is sea ice. Um, there are a number of different sensors uh, that can detect and map sea ice. Um, in the bottom right here, you can see an optical uh, image. So this is from uh, an ocean color sensor, um, but also the altimeters uh, and some of the other uh, sensors can give us information on the thickness of sea ice, as well as just it's obviously from the image in the bottom right here, you can see where it is, but you can't tell how thick it is. Whereas some of the other sensors, you have penetrating uh, information uh, and you can uh, look at the actual sea ice thickness. Um, you can also identify features such as icebergs or uh, leads in the ice um, and start to map those over time as well. Um, a relatively new addition um, in terms of the variables that we can map from space is salinity. And this is quite a tricky one to measure. Um, but basically, the, the principle is that the salinity of the water changes its emissivity. Um, and we can detect that signal uh, from, from the, the satellite sensors. So here you can obviously see there's a huge um, freshwater plume coming out of the Amazon. Uh, which is quite clear uh, and again also some of these um, cooler upwelling waters uh, off the coast as well and um, you can see our lower salinity compared to the very warm waters uh, in the center of these uh, what we call gyres in the oceans and then moving on to um, ocean color so ocean color is the particular um, remote sensing topic that both Shuba and i uh, specialize in um, so with ocean color, unlike a number of the other sensors, such as sea surface temperature or salinity, where you're looking really at the very surface skin of the ocean, uh, ocean color uh, can look a little deeper into the waters. Uh, so sometimes you might be getting a signal from the top 10 meters uh, of the ocean. Sometimes you might be getting a signal um, from even down to 50, 60, uh, or slightly deeper. Um, and in this beautiful image uh, that um, showing some waters near the Falkland Islands. Uh, you can see there's a large amount of green, which is from phytoplankton. So these are the tiny single cell plants um, that are responsible for about half of uh, the photosynthesis uh, on a global scale. Um, and some of those uh, algae also form little shells. Um, and that's what's causing the white uh, in this image. Uh, it's from a, a group of algae called coccolithophores. And they, they obviously highlight uh, the ocean currents uh, as they are transported, as they kind of just float around. Um, but uh, yeah, images like this, you could almost, uh, almost see as paintings. They're really very, very beautiful. But I think Shubal will probably show more of this uh, later. Um, so then uh, from those ocean color images, we can generate maps like this or, or a time series like this. Um, and this really lets us watch the ocean breathe. Um, so these bright features uh, in the, the northern and southern hemisphere um, that you see pulsing is effectively a huge bloomed life. Um, whereas the, the centers, these darker colors uh, in the middle of the oceans are basically like deserts um, and there's very, very low uh, amounts of biomass. Um, and so now we have about, again, uh, the ocean color record goes back to about 1997, so we're approaching 25 years uh, of data, uh, and we can start to look at whether there's any significant trends. As the equivalent on land would be things like changes in forest cover or um, uh, desertification and these sorts of things. Uh, so we can really look at the processes going on in the in the fundamental biology of the oceans. And. Um, Ravi talked about access to data, and he was he was right. There's a lot of data. Um, the raw data coming in from all of these various satellites is petabytes in size. It's enormous, and that can be quite hard to access um, for some users. It's you know if you want a single picture, that's okay. If you want to do something uh, meaningful, you have to access uh, data in a more structured manner, and one of the, the good places to start uh, is climate data records. So that's uh, this CCI initiative. 
has created climate data records, which are relatively user friendly. There's a lot of standardization that's gone into it. There's been a lot of work done on making sure that the data is of top quality, uh, is reliable and is therefore usable uh, in climate science. Um, as an example, uh, the Ocean Color CCI uh, has now produced global one kilometer files. Uh, so that's what this uh, image is showing here. Um, but even that, uh, a single daily image on the full grid is about uh, 597 megapixels. Um, so it's, it's a large, uh, large image if you wanted to try and view it. Um, I tried to put it in terms of 4K TV screens just out of curiosity and it worked out being about 72. So it's a, it's a big wall <laughs> if you wanted a, a visual uh, full scale image uh, of this. Um, but uh, we've got this data hosted in a way that you can slice out sections that you want or areas that you're interested in and start to perform time series analysis and these sorts of things. Um, so rather than the petabytes, the, the one kilometer global data is about 54 terabytes, but we can access that in much smaller chunks now. Um, that's pretty much it for my summary. Uh, so it was a very quick touch on just all the different things or a number of different things that we can um, we can view from uh, remote sensing. I'm happy to answer any or and all questions um, on any of those topics. Um, but otherwise, uh, in the interest of time, especially because I think we're running a little late this evening, um, I will hand over to Shuba, uh, who will go into a bit more detail uh, about the beauty uh, and joys of ocean color. Thank you, Tom. Could you please uh, make Shiva the host now, and since you have the bet on currently? Go to participants. Uh, I'm not the host. I'm, I'm not the host, but everyone can share screen. So I okay, well done. I don't know how that happened, but that's exactly what we were after. Can you see anything? Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yep, we can see it. Yep. Sorry. I... Sorry, yes, we okay. can. Thank you. There we are. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. And thank you for staying so late to hear us talk about what holds us in its thrall. And in fact, it is ocean color. Um, it certainly has that effect on me. And um, from a scientist's point of view, I hope I can take a few minutes of your time to explain why it is so. So, um, ocean color or our fascination with the color of the ocean is not new. In fact, over the centuries, the color of the ocean has inspired poets, artists, geographers, sailors, fishermen, and explorers, among others. Um, some of these images I have are watercolors painted by Sir Alistair Hardy, who was a famous biological oceanographer. But scientists, uh, artists and painters have been able to capture the changing color of the water with stunning effect over the centuries. And the color of the water does change with what is in it. And here I have some examples of watercolor by Winslow Homer, an American watercolor artist. Now, we can do this from satellites. We can observe changes in the color of the water from satellites. And here are some stunning examples. And to my eye, they rival what the artists create. Nature always has the surprise to, has the ability to surprise us by its beauty. But why do we do this from a scientist's point of view? A lot of it has to do with the fact that color 
is linked to life on our planet. Let us look, for example, at these three images. The left one shows us uh, a picture of a forest on land. We are all familiar with that. Some of you may have seen forests of uh, seaweed, notably kelp, in coastal areas. And they are green. And we instinctively relate green color with life, and especially plant life. But when we turn to the oceans, it begins to get a bit puzzling. In the open ocean, where are the forests? We see the blue ocean, and we may be misled into believing that there are no forests in the ocean. And that would be a mistake, because there are forests. The reason we don't see it see them very readily is that they are made up of microscopic plants that we collectively refer to as phytoplankton. Here is an example of one phytoplankton type that you can find in the ocean. And the interesting thing about them is that they have all the functionalities of plants on land. They contain pigments that they use to absorb sunlight, and uh, they can do photosynthesis with the absorbed light. In fact, there are thousands of varieties or species of phytoplankton in the ocean, and they are absolutely beautiful if you can look at them under a microscope. If you ever get a chance, don't pass by that opportunity because they are magnificent little creatures. In fact, they, their very beauty have inspired artists. There is a group of phytoplankton. There are uh, thousands of species of this particular group in the ocean called the diatoms. What's special about them is that they have an outer shell made of almost pure glass, silica. And I learned that Victorian ladies used to be fascinated by these little objects, and they used to arrange them under, in, a, in patterns to admire their beauty. I believe that this art form had died out until just the other day I learned that there is at least one living artist, Klaus Kemp in the UK, who collects diatoms and creates these magnificent uh, microscopic slides using the shells, the glass shells of diatoms. So they are beautiful. Um, there are a, lot, a huge biodiversity of them in the oceans, but we can't see them because they are so tiny. If you look at them clo in close quarters with your naked eye, you need a microscope. Just to give you an idea of how small we are talking, if you look at a tall tree, and then you look at the smallest of the phytoplankton in the ocean, these minute organisms in the sea are about 100 million times smaller than the tallest trees. So close up, we cannot see them. But the interesting thing about phytoplankton is that if you pull away from the surface of the ocean, say, in, into space, and you look at the ocean from a distance, then you begin to see these swirls and patterns of distribution of phytoplankton in the ocean because their collective impact is huge. 
And this is what the modern day satellites are designed to observe. Here is an animation of uh, the ESA satellites capturing ocean color using a spectral radiometer that is looking at the ocean at different wavelengths in the visible domain. And you see that where there are large quantities of phytoplankton, the satellite picks up that information. And you saw some more examples of these beautiful images that satellite makes in uh, Tom's picture. So they are beautiful, they are tiny, they are uh, observable, but are they important? It turns out that indeed they are very important. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, tiny as they are, they perform all the functions of plant, plants and trees on land. They absorb solar energy, they do photosynthesis, and they convert carbon dioxide in the ocean into organic material. So this is the basic food source for all life in the ocean. And if you look at the amount of phytoplankton, uh, sorry, the amount of carbon fixed by phytoplankton, it's of the order of 50 gigatons of carbon per annum spread out over the whole ocean. And this is comparable to the net primary production of photosynthesis on land. We are all aware of the importance of uh, the rainforests or even every single tree on land because of their function in taking up carbon dioxide and producing oxygen. But not many people realize that these little organisms, these phytoplankton, also perform the same function for us over the oceans. So that make them important players in the global carbon cycle. In fact, uh, now it is recognized that um, if to understand our climate, we have to monitor phytoplankton, ideally through ocean color, over very long time scales using uh, systematic and sustained methods. And they are now in a list of essential climate variables that we have to observe on a routine basis at the global scale. So let me leave you with this image of primary production in the ocean observed using satellites. And with the satellites giving us these pictures on an almost daily basis, it may be quick to see that this is our only way of observing the vastness of the ocean, in fact, two thirds of our planet in a continuous and systematic manner. And let me stop there so that we can discuss more about what might interest you, either from what you knew before or what you have learned today. And I thank you very much. And let me stop this. Thank you. And let me stop sharing, I think, uh, if I can. Perfect. Um, Here we are. Thank you so much. There's so much in there that uh, we can make use of. Uh, I know you can't see me. Uh, it's uh, Andrew Dubber talking. Uh, I'm the director of MTF Labs. Michaela is right here as well. But what I wanted to do while I have you there uh, is to see if anybody in the room has any questions or anything that they would like to comment on. And I think probably rather than them shout it to me and then me repeat it, uh, if they were to run up to the microphone and say hi, or just come to the front and I can hand the microphone over. Uh, is there anybody who wants to? 
Be the first on this. Nobody wants to be first. That's the problem. Can you hear it? I can tell you what Robertina is saying. So Robertina is somebody who goes and puts microphones into the ocean and uh, and measures things from right up close. And she wants to know the difference between measurements from afar. Uh, have I have I? Um, I'm going to. Um, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do, which is to bring you the microphone, because I'm not going to do your question any justice, because I am not the oceanographer in this conversation. This is Robertina Shebjanic. Hello. Hi. So it was really lovely to listen to all of your um, presentations. So for me, it's just very interesting always when I see these remote sensing um, techniques. Uh, how, what is the difference between when you are like really doing this remote sensing or being in the field and how can you correlate these two different variations of data? Make sense? Will I take this one? Yeah, go yeah. for it. Okay. Um, so I think one of the things we always try uh, and emphasize is the importance of the in-situ data. All of the work that we do with remote sensing data has to be validated against uh, in-situ measurements. Um, the, the, and there are some extremely valuable time series uh, in places like uh, Hawaii and Bermuda, uh, where they have gone out and taken measurements for you know, 70, 80 years, where it's you know, really, really um, rigorously done. And um, we can use that as a, as a measure of how well uh, we can detect things with the satellites. But what the in-situ measurements can't do is give us the global coverage and the global view. And it really, you need both things. You have to have the in-situ measurements to validate and then the satellites to give you the big picture. Um, but I should state, especially when we come to this, this climate change initiative data, all of it, there's been a huge amount of work to validate it um, against the in-situ measurements. And also a lot of the, the satellite data comes with some estimate of the uncertainty in that product as well. Shuba, did, did you want to say anything, Shuba? Because I, was I, I could add to that, Robertina. Uh, one other thing that I could add to what Tom said is that the oceans are extremely complex. So there are so many things that we know how to measure directly from the field that we cannot measure from a satellite. So we do need uh, observations from the field to give us a more complete picture. For example, the satellites only look at a surface layer of the ocean, and uh, the oceans go down in the deeper parts to thousands of meters. So if we want to know what's happening below the surface, we need things in the water. It can be ships, it can be uh, automatic, uh, remotely controlled ve vehicles. It can be installations at the bottom of the sea, or it can be a ship that takes you there and you put some instruments down, collect your samples and make observations. But, but we need all of those to be able to understand the oceans. Andrew, if I could just chip in as well from a sort of non-scientist perspective. I mean, I, I'm not an oceanographer, um, but I've been around this data for quite a long time and, and excited by it. And I mean, first of all, can I just say thank you to Shuba and Tom for those two fantastic talks. I could personally listen to Shuba talking all night. And uh, those images are really, really, really beautiful. Um, I think one thing Shuba said, which I think is really kind of arresting, even for me after so many years of, of knowing about all of this, is that ocean colour um, she would correct me if this is not quite the right thing to say, but it's almost as if it's become a science, a, a, a truly global science, a science in a new way in the satellite era. It couldn't exist in its current form without satellites. 
Um, and it's that realization that there are certain things that satellites do that nothing else can do, which I think is quite powerful. And also then to realize that those incredibly beautiful images that Shuba just showed us of those structures in the ocean, those biological structures, those huge masses of, of phytoplankton uh, swirling in the currents, um, they are incredibly small organisms, as, as was just pointed out, yet we can see them at scale from hundreds of miles above the Earth. And that view then tells us more about what's happening within the Earth system than we would know just by measuring uh, at the surface level. So I think that's an important thing to just keep in mind is that, yes, satellite data absolutely generally needs to be highly corroborated, but often it's also providing something unique. Um, and, and, and it gives you a, a sense of the fragility and the vulnerability and the beauty all at once uh, of those, uh, those parts of the system that are under pressure. Yeah, absolutely, Rivi. I think um, I'm old enough to have witnessed the ocean color revolution when it happened. And it's not an exaggeration to call it a revolution. Before that, all you could do was uh, take a ship out into the sea, then uh, stop the ship, launch your instruments, which, and then collect samples, which could take a couple of hours, then steam to the next station, stop, collect. And if you were out at sea for about two weeks, you came back with, I don't know, 100 or 200 data points. Then you analyzed them in the lab. Then you sat down and plotted each one of those numbers and drew a graph. And then you said, huh, phytoplankton was more here or less there. So if you haven't lived through that experience, it might be just impossible to see, to Imagine what a revelation it was when you, we all saw the first ocean color image in all its glory, in so much detail, so much of movement. You could see the Gulf Stream by looking at this, at the phytoplankton. It was an amazing uh, moment. And you are right, it is a, an, a global science. It is a new field. As sciences go, it is still new. So yeah, it is a revolutionary um, time. Margarida, please. Um, hello, my name is Margarida, and um, I have a question. Maybe it starts from a rumor, but a researcher from Durham University, Elizabeth Johnson, that works on the labor conditions of non-humans on the molecular scale, she once told me that there are studies done with phytoplankton color changes that are being used for military AI predictive systems studies. I'm also thinking of how to understand the application of this data for security projects. Do you have information regarding this matter? Um, <laughs> interesting. Uh, the military have always been interested in, uh, well, if not ocean color, um, specifically, they've certainly been interested from a long time with light underwater, which is intimately related to ocean color as well. The reason for that is simple. The light penetration and in the water and how much light is available at any given time um, affects visibility underwater. So if you are a naval strategist and you want to uh, think about underwater defense or attack mechanisms, you want to be able to know, can you, can you or your, if you are a scuba diver or a submarine, how well can you hide it from the enemy? Or if, an in, if you are under threat, how fast can you detect the enemy visually? So they've always been interested in uh, light underwater. Um, so no, that I don't think it is just a rumor. The military uh, applications of uh, most of these satellite devices are uh, quite strong. Um, if you take uh, uh, the currents, for example, uh, if they are navigating, but that is not just military, the commercial ships also 
if they want to navigate, they would like to know where the currents are, how fast they are going, can they exploit them or should they avoid them. So oceanography in general is of great interest to uh, the Navy. Any further questions? This was really, really interesting. Um, if, if not, um, I thank you so much for this session. This is a complete eye-opener, I think, for everybody, and I think they need to process some of this uh, over the next uh, few days. Um, but we thank you so much also for your patience for staying with us so late. Um, and uh, we hope that we can also reconnect and perhaps we can follow up on, uh, on uh, some of the engagement here um, uh, that has happened. Absolutely. And if there are questions or, or any uh, wish to contact us, Tom has given some information. You can also contact us either through Revi or through Sitara. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm sure that everybody is going to be uh, very, very happy to do that. Um, so, a round of applause. This is a wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure for us. I wish we could see you. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, I don't know if you can. Uh, can do you? Uh, no, not true. <laughs> I think I think uh, uh, Andrew is trying to fix. Are you trying to fix no, it? You can. He will send photographs, he says. He's got exactly. photographs of people's reactions. Thank you so much. Sorry we can't see you. Um, uh, yeah, it is a, it is a shame. I think they were trying to work it both ways uh, somehow. We can see both us and you. I'm not sure why it can't, it can't work the other way around, but uh, no. Trust, trust me, he says. Okay, he will, he will send, he will send uh, photos and footage. But uh, thank you so much, and we will definitely reconnect. Um, uh, so um, it's been a great pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you and, and good luck with the rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.